Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in some previous lectures of EC3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at current mirrors and current sources built out of bipolar junction transistors. On my 2BJT current source lecture, somebody left the comment, not covering the Widelar current source, and I realized that indeed was a pretty serious oversight on my part. So let's correct that. Like a lot of legendary analog circuit designers, Bob Widlar was a really interesting character, so I recommend you spend some time with your favorite search engine reading about him. In a previous lecture on current mirrors, we looked at this basic two-transistor mirror. Like in our previous lecture, we're going to neglect the early effect when computing the output gear, but you can throw in the early effect if you want to, and Marshall explains how to do that in his online notes. In the simplified analysis, if beta is sufficiently large, the output current will very closely match the reference current. We use a Widelar current mirror when we would like the output current to actually be less than the reference current. To achieve this, we place an emitter resistor down here that goes to the negative voltage rail. So, making this minor change has a very interesting effect. To study this in detail, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just assume beta is infinite. Of course, this is not a thing that can happen in real life, but it is going to simplify our math a bit. Essentially, what we're doing when we say beta equals infinity is we're assuming that the base currents are negligible. So let's take a look at the simplified ebers mole equation for the transistor on the left. We haven't looked at the ebers mole equation in a while. Remember that we're assuming that no current is flowing through the bases, so the collector current of Q1 is going to match IRF, and it's going to be equal to the reverse saturation current IS times this exponential of the base to emitter voltage here at Q1 divided by the thermal voltage. So I can apply the ebers mole equation to the transistor on the right, and write an equation for the output current. So this expression in here in the numerator, this is VBE2. And here's the main trick of the Widelar current mirror. If we think about the voltage from the bases of the transistors to V minus, well, that's VBE1. So the difference from this base to V minus over here is VBE1. But there's this current I0 flowing through RE. So there's a voltage drop across that. So only part of VBE1 is actually dropping across the base emitter junction of Q2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take VBE1, which is this total drop, and I'm going to take away some voltage from that, which is IO times RE by Ohm's law. So because the voltage here for the base emitter junction for the transistor on the right is smaller than for the transistor on the left, the transistor on the right is not as turned on as the transistor on the left, so it's going to produce less current. So the next thing we'll do is we'll divide these two equations. So I have IRF over IO on the left. These VBE1 terms wind up canceling out. And the argument to my exponential is going to be IO times RE over VT. And quite importantly, these saturation currents here cancel out. Remember, we're assuming that these transistors have matched characteristics. Remember that IS varies tremendously with a whole bunch of factors, including temperature. It's actually a bigger source and variation in your current that you get on the left than the temperature variation you get in VT. So while you will still get some variation in temperature associated with VT here, the big source of variation associated with IS goes away. And remember, you never really know what IS is. It's going to vary all over the place. So an important part of electronic design is to set up your circuits with transistors in combination so these saturation currents wind up canceling. 
Now, if you wanted to model the effect of different saturation currents, you could call this, say, IS1 and call this IS2, in which case you would get a ratio of saturation currents here. And you'd still be okay as long as those saturation currents are varying in a similar way with other circuit parameters like the temperature. So whether you have a constant in front of the exponent or not, there's no way to solve for IO, the output current, in closed form. Now, it's not too hard to rearrange this and write an iterative algorithm to find IO, given the other quantities in the equation. But here's the interesting thing. I can take the equation here and take the logarithm on both sides. That's a natural log. And then I can multiply both sides by VT and divide both sides by IO. And I wind up with an expression for RE. So given a particular reference current and given a target output current, you can find the appropriate resistance RE that will give you the desired result. Now, I would like to be able to find out what the small signal output resistance we get seen looking into the collector here. In order to compute that, I'm going to need to know the small signal Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base of Q2. Now, we need to treat Q1 very carefully. Strapping the collector to the base turns this into a diode-connected BJT. So you really need to think about it as a two-terminal device instead of a three-terminal device. Now, you might be tempted to look at Marshall Leach's formula sheet and say, okay, let's take the resistance seen looking into the base and take that in parallel with the resistance seen looking into the collector. But that doesn't work. That turns into nonsense if you connect the collector to the base. If you look at our derivations, you'll see that nothing winds up making sense. Our equivalent circuit for looking into the base is computed with the collector sort of dangling out here and the equivalent circuit we compute looking into the collector has the base dangling out here. Connecting the base and the collector directly breaks all of our derivations. So the best way to handle this is actually to create a new equivalent resistance by going back and looking at one of the original small signal models. It's more convenient to use the T model than the Pi model in this instance. We haven't looked at a small signal model directly in a while. If you need to, you can go back and watch my lecture on BJT small signal models. Now, when we connect the base and the collector, we see we basically have a two terminal element. So the emitter current that's flowing through the bottom here is the same as what's flowing through the top. That's the current flowing through this diode equivalent. And if I think about our collector voltage here, well, that's really also all the way down here. So if I look at what I see between the collector and the emitter, I see two resistances in parallel. Our small signal equivalent diode resistance is equal to RE in parallel with R0. Now, if R0 is a lot bigger than RE, this essentially goes away and you just have RE. And in fact, all of the textbooks that I've seen just say that this diode equivalent resistance is RE. They don't make any particular mention of R0. I like to leave the R0 in explicitly at first, and then you can ignore it if you think it's appropriate. So our output resistance of our current mirror is the resistance seen looking into the collector. We have a couple of formulas for that. I'm going to use the formula in terms of alphas. Notice that I am including the alpha here. I'm not assuming this is one anymore, AKA I'm not assuming beta is infinite anymore, since it's just as easy to include it as not include it. I need the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of Q2. Well, that is just RE. Now I need to know what RIE is. We have a couple of formulas for that. I'm going to use this one. In order to compute this, we're going to need the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out of the base. And that's going to be the small signal resistance of this diode connected BJT in parallel with whatever the small signal resistance is seen looking up into our current reference. And here I'm just calling that RF. So substituting in the expression for the 
resistance of the diode connected BJT we computed on the previous slide. We wind up with this. And in practice, R01 is usually pretty big compared to the other quantities, so you can usually ignore it. To finish this out, remember that the intrinsic BJT emitter resistances are given in terms of the emitter currents. And I can find those emitter currents in terms of the associated collector currents and the associated alpha parameters. Now, usually if you're wanting to think about the output resistance, you would not compute this out in all of this gory detail. You would make a lot of approximations along the way and just get something in the ballpark. Now, in general, when talking about current mirrors, I've been fairly vague about what's creating this reference current. A common application of current mirrors is to take a mediocre current source and to make a better current source out of it. So let's think of one particular mediocre current source, and that would be to just put a resistor here going to the positive rail. So to figure out how to size this resistor, let's write a KVL equation. The voltage difference between V plus and V minus consists of two drops. One is this drop IREF times R1 associated with Ohm's law. And then I'm also going to snake around here and then have a drop of VBE1 across the base emitter junction of transistor 1. And we usually assume this to be something like 0.65 or 0.7. Again, that's just a convention. So I can take my VBE term and move it over to the left-hand side. And you can actually write an equation like that directly if you just think about this circuit for a second. And then I can divide by R1 and get our reference current in terms of R1. Of course, I can also swap the locations of IREF and R1 in this equation and get an expression for R1 in terms of IREF. So that lets me pick R1. Now, if I want to figure out what the output impedance of our fancy current source is over here on the right, one of the quantities I needed was the small signal resistance seen looking up into my current reference here, and that's just R1. Now, if you were to get rid of RE, so if we just set RE equal to zero, then we have our old-fashioned standard two transistor current source, and this will actually set our output current. Well, I should say, if we assume that beta is infinite and alpha is equal to one, if beta is not infinite, our output will be a little bit less. And also, we've assumed that when we're computing this, we're not worrying about the early effect. The early effect can actually cause your output current to go up a bit, but quite often people don't worry about it. Anyway, meditating upon this a little bit makes us realize why Weidler invented this to begin with. Imagine you want a small current. Well, if you want a small current, you may need to have a really big resistor. If you're building a circuit on a printed circuit board out of discrete BJTs and you've got discrete resistors, you can easily find resistors that go up into the mega ohm range. But if you're designing an integrated circuit, then having a big resistor on your integrated circuit that's a really difficult thing. That's going to take up a ton of real estate. So being able to use a reasonably sized resistor here by putting a resistor here is a very helpful thing in integrated circuit design. This is an example from the 741 data sheet. There's a wide LAR current mirror down here, although it's flipped horizontally from the way we've been drawing it. It's a little bit more complicated because this resistor here to create the reference current isn't directly tied to the upper rail. There's a PNP in the way, but the same idea applies. Going from the positive to the negative rail, there's a VBE drop here, and then there's going to be a drop across this resistor, and then there's another VBE drop here. So you could use that information to figure out what the reference current is, and then I have an emitter resistor down here to create a current over here. Moving away from our current sources for a moment, Let's revisit the Wilson current mirror we looked at in a previous lecture. I can do the same sort of trick by using a resistor to create the reference current, except here I snake through two VBE drops. So I have a VBE drop over Q3, and then I have another one over Q1. Now, the way this circuit is set up, that's going to be the same as the VBE drop over Q2. 
And there's all kinds of other games you can play with current mirrors. You can take structures like this and stack them on top of each other to form a cascode configuration that will give you a very high output impedance. You can also play games where you take the output part of the structure and make copies of it to create copies of the current. That can be very useful. You can also take different combinations of BJTs in parallel or play sizing games in an integrated circuit design, particularly with MOSFETs, to create current gain or current attenuation. There's all kinds of things you can do. In this series of lectures, I just wanted to give you a few of the concepts. So if you're not taking EC3400 with me, you can check out here. But if you are taking EC3400, I want you to log into Canvas and look for a quiz titled something like Wadlar Quiz. So this isn't a quiz in which I'm asking anything that has to do with the material in the lecture. Here, I want to get your opinions on education because I spend a lot of time thinking about pedagogical approaches. So the main thing I would like you to do is give me your thoughts on a tiny clip of this video of an interview of music educator Rick Beato by Spitfire Audio co-founder and media composer Christian Henson. If you're into music, I would recommend watching the whole thing. But for the purposes of this assignment, I just want you to watch from the 37 minute, 8 second mark to the 38 minute, 48 second mark in which Rick and Christian discuss education. And just give me a few sentences with your thoughts on their discussion. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? What lessons can be learned? Just generally, what's your impressions?